That's our text this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. And our sermon title is Conduct Worthy of King and Cause. And we are in part four of this series, walking through this paragraph in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, looking at the reasons that Paul gives here for his instruction and correction in this letter to Timothy. And it's all summed up in these verses here, and he gives us glorious reasons to be motivated to obey this, motivated to respond rightly, and then motivated to live fervently for the Lord as the house of God, as the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And let's take a look at this passage together as we get into these final verses here today. It begins in verse 14, these things, Paul says, I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed... I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Now, all of Paul's correction, all of Paul's instruction in 1 Timothy 3 here, uh, in 1 Timothy, is described in these verses as an exhortation to right conduct. Right conduct because we are the house of God. We are the family of God together. We are His people and we are His dwelling place. We're exhorted to right conduct because we are the called out assembly of the saints, the saints of the living God. We are His testimony to a lost world. We are His salt, His light in this world. All right conduct because we are the pillar and the basis on which He has set up and displays his life-changing, eternal, saving truth and displays that to a lost world that is heading, rushing, headlong into judgment. All of this truth demands, as we've seen in weeks past, demands a right response. We're to respond correctly to correction. And that response is with right conduct. Our king is worthy. His cause is worthy. And therefore, we must respond with right conduct. We know that judgment is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. Jesus Christ will either deliver or he will destroy. And that judgment should impel us, compel us to right conduct. Paul certainly supports this exhortation to right response, right conduct, with good reasons, with great motivators. And we've looked at those in in past weeks. We are God's household that is to manifest his truth. We are to be set apart and live out that truth as the people of God. We are the church, and as the church, we are the structure on which God displays and holds up His truth to the world. We are the pillar and basis for truth. And these reasons then become the motivator, become the basis on which we conform our lives, conform our conduct to God's truth, to that truth. In one sense, you could say that, well, in the Scripture, God says it, and so that settles it, and that's enough, right? But it just doesn't stop there. These aren't just simply rules for the sake of rules. These aren't exhortations and corrections simply for the sake of obedience to exhortations and corrections, not rules for rules' sake. There is something that is far greater at stake here. You and I are a part of something that is far greater than simply a bunch of rules following. There's reasons behind this. There is something at stake behind it. God's name is to be hallowed in us before the eyes of the Gentiles, because God is zealous for his name, and they are to hallow his name. The kingdom of God must be advanced on the earth. We're talking about heaven and hell, a lifetime, an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. People's souls hang in the balance. The gospel must go out. And the gospel, in today's day and age, the gospel must cut through the filth of this world. And oftentimes, the filth that has been peddled by the professing church, it has to cut through. And Christ must receive the full reward of his suffering. That phrase there, full reward of his suffering, is from a story. It's a story about uh, distant people who were enslaved, and two men being convicted that the gospel could not penetrate that environment. Their slave masters wouldn't allow it. And the gospel wasn't getting in. And slaves were dying and dropping into hell. Two men became so convicted by the word of God 
and being burdened for those lost people, took it upon themselves to sell themselves into a lifetime of slavery and certain death in order to get the gospel into that community. They took their responsibility seriously. They took their responsibility as pillars and grounds of truth to get the gospel into that environment and to see God work. They left their loved ones, sold themselves into slavery, and as the boat was pulling out into the harbor, one of the men is reported to have turned to his family and said this, that Christ must receive the full reward of his suffering. We're a part of something greater. This means far more than just following rules. There's something at stake that is far greater, something of which you are a part that is far greater than you, that demands, that compels our effort, that compels our lives. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're to be the pillar and ground of this truth. The gospel, in many ways today, is being swamped out in the hearing of many because of the wicked lies of this world. By oftentimes the wicked lies or deceptive half-truths of a modern so-called professing church that has forsaken the book. And we, those with the truth that stand as the pillar and ground of the truth, are to hold up, to display, to herald, to proclaim that gospel in a way that cuts through that deafening swamp of filth and error. If you can imagine being in Britain during the war... When the bombing was coming, listen, there is a judgment coming. There's a judgment coming. But when the bombing was coming, air raid sirens would shriek through whatever you were doing, whatever chatter was going on, in such a way that it arrested your attention. It compelled you to take cover. It compelled you to flee danger. The gospel of Jesus Christ must be displayed, must be proclaimed, must be heralded in such a way that even in the midst of this wicked and perverse generation that teaches lies, it is to be proclaimed in such a way that it is as an air raid siren to a lost world that needs to duck and cover because judgment is coming. It must cut through the shallow and wicked doctrines of this world. He gives us right reasons, but thirdly, the right response and right conduct, these great reasons, lead to, by inference, doesn't it, that we have great responsibility in this. We see the right response. We see the reasons for response, but also in these verses, we see a great responsibility. By virtue of our identity, our nature, and our function as the church that we've described over the last several weeks, we have great responsibility. We have great responsibility, seen in verse 15 and 16, to live the truth that we proclaim to live the truth that has been delivered to us. We have great responsibility to uphold that truth, to proclaim that truth, to evangelize with that truth, and we have a great responsibility to worship the source, the embodiment of that truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not to think of membership in the church in terms of rights. We are to think of membership in the church in terms of responsibility. We have great responsibility. Luke 12, 48 says, For everyone to whom much is given... Have you been given much in Christ? Amen. We've been given an infinite gift, an immeasurable gift, an unspeakable gift. We've been given much, much, so much that we can't grasp it in our own feeble attempts. We can't grasp it with our own minds. We've been given much. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. We have great responsibility. One well-known semer- seminary communicates their responsibility this way, for the truth, for the church, for the world, for the glory of God. I like that. It's a good way of expressing that. We're to be for the truth. That's for the mutual edification of saints in Christ for the church. That is for the evangelization of the lost. It's for the world. All ultimately for the glory of God. Where do you fail in that? Are you failing in upholding the truth? Believing some deceptive false gospel, some deceptive lie, Are you failing in your responsibility to the church to edify the saints, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up your brother and sister in the faith until we all attain to a perfect measure, a perfect man in Christ? Are you failing in your responsibility to the world to share the gospel, to get the gospel out, to see the Lord work through his gospel to save souls? All 
of that, we fail to uphold the glory of God and the work that He's given us to do. Out of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 16, flows a great responsibility for how we are to live, how we are to live the truth of God. Obviously, we respond with right conduct for our own personal holiness, our own individual personal spiritual well-being. The Lord says, be holy, for I am holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You have your individual responsibility to that. But here, in the context of chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, we see that intimately connected to the local church, to our part in the local church, our responsibility to the local church. You have that responsibility to live a holy life for yourself, but you also have the responsibility to live a holy life for the church, which is to be represented in the world as the house of God, the church of the living God, a pillar, a display of the truth. We have responsibility because we are collectively the church together. And that's the context here. There is a relationship between us and the church. The church of the living God is to embody the truth of God and to display that truth in the way that they live. The church then is called to manifest the truth in its conduct. We are to conform to that truth and then to proclaim it. This is great responsibility. And it's our personal discipline as it relates to the larger context. Let me give you an example. Just a couple of pages to the right. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Here the Bible speaks of this personal responsibility, but also puts it in the context again of the church. Look at beginning at verse 14. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Here Paul says, remind them. This is the same author, the same context, the same church. Okay, Remind them of these things. Charge them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. The only profit is in God's truth. The only profit is in God's truth. If we fail to speak those things, fail to uphold that, then it is no gain to us. It is to the ruin of the hearers. Many churches today do not uphold the whole counsel of God. Do not uphold the truth of God. Preach a half gospel of all grace and no repentance. They're not giving the bad news with the good news, and so the good news has no context, has no meaning, has no import. They do that to the ruin of the hearers. We have to preach the whole counsel of God. Verse 15, it says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In order for us to be a pillar and ground of the truth, you need to be a person of the truth. You need to rightly handle the Word of God. In order to rightly handle the Word of God, you have to know the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Invest yourself in the Word of God. I can't tell you how many conversations we've had with someone who does not know the Word, does not invest themselves in the Word, does not understand Scripture, can't find their way around Scripture any more than they can find their way around a paper bag, and yet begin to come to this point and say they're rightly dividing the Word of truth. Or that I understand the word of truth. Or I can correctly apply the word of truth to my life. You have to invest yourself in the word of truth in order to know the word of truth, in order to rightly divide the word of truth. It's imperative if we're to be collectively the pillar and ground of the truth. It's a necessity for us collectively, but we collectively are you individually. (laughs) We must do that. Look at verse 16. Exhorts them to shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Again, there's that trending toward error that produces ungodliness. Great is the mystery of godliness, the Scripture says. That which accords with the truth is that which will eventuate in godly living. If your life isn't godly, then you're not in the truth. If you claim to be a Christian and your life isn't godly, it's one of two things. Either you're not investing yourself in this truth and you're not a part of this truth, Or you're outside this truth altogether and you have believed a lie and you are lost. Now this truth authors godliness. And it authors godliness by the Spirit of God in the life of a genuine believer. Impossible apart from that. Impossible apart from Christ. But in the power of the Spirit, in the power of His might, this mystery, this gospel, this truth produces godliness. Verse 17, their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort. That's why we've got to dig that cancer out when it crops up. Who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some. Now listen to this. That truth, despite the fact that many don't believe it, 
despite that in their sin many reject it, despite the fact that in this wicked world there are lies told about it, that it is twisted, that it is distorted, that it is corrupted, that it is hoarded and never proclaimed, the truth still stands and will not be thwarted. Look at verse uh, 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In other words, this truth is sealed and held, proclaimed, displayed by those who say they have the truth, and yet they live the truth and proclaim the truth. Live the truth in the sense that they depart from iniquity. That's our identity. That's our essence, our nature as a church. Those called out people of God that live holy lives as a testimony to the world of Christ, of the truth of God, and then display it. Those who proclaim it, those who herald it. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We are to be different from the world and different in a way that is observably evident to them. Have you ever noticed that a genuine Christian can be a walking rebuke or bring conviction simply by walking into a room. <laughs> Ever walked into a room of ungodly people when they know you're a Christian and all of a sudden the, talk, the talking stops or everything becomes a little quieter or maybe they roll their eyes. <laughs> genuine Christian can be a rebuke just by virtue of walking into a room. A genuine Christian gives testimony by their life to the life-changing power of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says this, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. You are to be light and salt in the world. You are to be a testimony to Christ and in the midst of a hard-hearted, wicked, and perverse generation, you are to be an open rebuke to those that are perishing just by virtue of your holy life. Now, this responsibility involves a personal spiritual commitment on your part and a discipline to be holy. And that impacts our stance, our standing as the church together. First Timothy here, in context, is connected to the local church. And our personal conduct reflects our identity, reflects our nature, our function as a church together. You are a part of something that is greater than yourself, greater than yourself. And in that, you have responsibility. The disciplines here, the commitment, the conduct of the individual impacts the whole. It impacts what we are together as a church. We are individuals who make up a larger body that has a testimony, that has a work, that has a function. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12, don't we? One is an eye, one is a hand, one is an ear. Collectively, we are the body of Christ and we're to function as the body of Christ. What if the hand is not a person of the book? What if the hand is not a person who prays? What if the hand is not availing himself of the means of grace? The body suffers. There's an old story that I think has uh, uh, an example for us here. It talks about a battle that took place. And it says, for the loss of a nail the shoe was lost. For the loss of the shoe, the horse was lost. For the loss of the horse, the rider was lost. For the loss of the rider, the battle was lost. For the loss of the battle, the war was lost, and all because of the loss of a horseshoe nail. <laughs> the part makes up the whole. We have great responsibility to do our part for the sake of the whole. When the Lord exhorts us that we are to be the pillar and ground of the truth, that means you individually. That means me individually. We have a part to play. Whether you're a hand, an ear, an eye, a foot, a leg, a hair, you're, you have a part to play in the body of Christ. We have to collectively be responsible to uphold that. Now, let me give you an example of one way that we are to uphold that. And we must uphold it. Think of this, the Lord gathers his people as faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? By the word of God. The Lord gathers his people as faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That then results in a gathered out people who are gathered together around what? The word of God and Christ. He gathers the people to himself 
by the Word of God, through the power of His Spirit, collectively gathered around by the Word of God. We are to be then, collectively, the people of the book, the pillar and ground of the truth. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, the Bible says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. It's the word of His grace that we are commended to, to build us up and give us an inheritance. We are to be a people of the book. In that sense, we are to know the Bible, and we are to live the Bible. We're to know what it says and do what it says. It's just that simple. But now, therefore, collectively, if that's what we are, then you personally, in your connection to the church, are to individually be a person of the book. We're to be collectively the body, a people of the book, and you're to be a person of the book. It is your responsibility as an eye, as a hand, as a foot, to the whole. I love this passage in Joshua chapter 1. We don't have time to go there, but listen to what the words here in verses 7 through 9. The Lord says to Joshua, Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Listen, Christian, when you are ready to take action, and you know, you know that that action is in accord with God's word, upheld by God's word, it is the right thing to do. And according to your conscience, does that embolden you to be strong and courageous in taking that action? Yeah, because it's in accord with the word of God. If the word of God says it, it is true and we can live it. We can trust it. It is the word of God. It is infallible, inerrant. It's the inspired word of God. So we are to live it. We're to be strong and courageous when we have the word of God on our side. Do not turn, it goes on to say, to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. There are several purpose statements in there. One, you're to meditate in it day and night, that, in order that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. If you're not meditating in it day and night, in other words, every opportunity you get, I mean, American Express, don't leave home without it. <laughs> it should be in your briefcase, in your back pocket, in your backpack. This is the Word of God, and we're to live by this. In living by this truth, it is a truth that produces godliness. If you're having difficulty overcoming sin, how's your meditation day and night in the Word of God? If you're having difficulty with how to apply the Word of God to certain circumstances in your life, your marriage, your parenting, how are your meditations in the Word of God going? You're to give yourself to the Word of God so that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then it says, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The verse is also true. Don't do it. You will not be prosperous. You will not have. You may have temporal success. How many lost people do you know that enjoy temporal successes? But what matters is eternal success. What matters is success defined God's way. Verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Jim Hamilton has said that the Bible is to believers what universities, movies, sitcoms, and the media are to godless culture. I like that. Additionally, the Bible forms our community together then as a church. You individually, being a person of the book, Collectively, we become cultivated a people of the book, and then the book commands our attention. It commands our obedience, commands our identity together. In doing that, it determines our responses. It determines our community together as a church. It provides our common basis with one another. It commands holiness of life or right conduct, commitment to the truth. It defines who we are, and it defines who we are on the basis of who we represent. Therefore, you are to be a person of intense commitment to the Word of God. There's so many distractions to that, and churches give them left and right. It's just grace. No need to obey the Lord. No need to follow Scripture. What you getting all strung out about doctrine for? Doctrine divides. That's right. It divides truth from error. It divides the sheep from the goats. You know, have this experience, this spiritual experience. Speak in tongues. You know, you hear words. You have dreams or visions. That is a distraction from that which is made more sure, our perfect guide, the Scripture. We're to be people of the book. 
And people today in their flesh do everything they can to avoid being a people of the book. What's your Bible study like? How devoted are you to the Word of God? How habitually and practically do you apply the Scripture to your life? It's not a Sunday to Sunday thing. It's an everyday, 24-7, 365 thing. We're to be people of the book. The best thing that you can do for the local church is to be a person of the book. The best thing that you can do for your personal spiritual benefit is to be a part of a community of the book, a church that upholds the book, that faithfully, precisely handles the book, that preaches the book, that teaches the book, that lives the book. In each of us becoming a person of the book, we become a community, a people of the book. You see the symbiotic relationship here between the individual and the church. That's as the Lord des designed it. Jim Hamilton goes on to say that studying and living the Scripture is for the purpose of knowing God. Being conformed to the image of Christ results from seeing Christ in the Scriptures. Now tie that with Daniel 11, verse 32, which says, The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. I like that. I want our church to be described that way. The people of the book are strong, and in Christ we carry out great exploits. We have a great exploit to carry out, amen? We have the gospel, and we are to be heralds of the gospel. And I praise the Lord for the faithfulness to evangelism in this church. It is a blessing from God. We have an important task in that. Those people who know God are those who are able to take a stand for His truth. Um, and knowing that truth in his kingdom to them become more important than their own lives, more important than image, more important than wealth, more important than the approval of man, more important than leisure, more important than convenience. In that, together, we become the pillar and ground of the truth. That is living the truth. But also, in this passage, we have great responsibility here, obviously, to proclaim this truth. If we are the pillar and ground of the truth, we must proclaim it. We must evangelize, display it. And of course, this all ties together. We must be a people of the truth because the world and professing religion tells lies. This world is full of lies. It is under the sway of the original liar. And so we have to do our work to proclaim the truth. The word of truth is necessary to counteract the poison that is in this world, this wicked world, through lies. We must cut through the noise of error, the noise of deception. We must evangelize. Evangelism here is the function, if you will, of the pillar and basis of the truth. John 17, verse 14, Christ says to the Father, I have given them your word. That is the great legacy of the church. Jesus Christ has given to the church stewardship of his word. He has entrusted to the church the gospel of Jesus Christ to be taken to a lost world to gather in God's elect. We are a pillar and ground of the truth. Luke 24, verse 46 says this, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. It's pretty clear, right? In Acts 19, verse 20, we see the truth of God in the hands and on the lips of God's faithful here in Ephesus. In this letter, where it says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. There's much wickedness. There's much that assaults itself against the knowledge of God. But in the hands of a, an evangelist, in the hands of a Christian who is a testimony of Christ, on the lips of that person, the word of God grows mightily and prevails. It is when the church... And that means not the church nebulously, that means you individually, me individually. When the church fails to proclaim, fails to herald that truth, the Word of God doesn't grow mightily, and the Word of God in the hearing of those lost souls doesn't prevail. We must carry the truth. This is so important in our world today. Consider our context. The truth is not being taught. It is insidious half-truths wrapped in a full lie. 
that gets taught, the whole counsel of God is rejected, is denied, even in the pulpits of many of those places that call themselves churches. It's the gospel, if you will, of felt needs. We'll just massage your felt needs. It's the gospel of give them what they want to hear. Whatever it takes to build the church, whatever it takes to grow the numbers, whatever it takes to give people what they want to hear so they'll come and then continue giving them what they want to hear so they'll stay. It is the preaching of good news without the context of bad news. And as such, that simply produces cheap grace in the hearers. It produces a salvation with no respect for sin, no respect for the wrath and judgment of God that is coming. In other words, if you don't know you're sick, how can you see your need for a physician? We have to preach the whole counsel of God. We have to preach the judgment of God, the wrath of God, the justice of God. Otherwise, there will be no sense for mercy, the need for mercy, the need for a Savior. That truth must be displayed. Grace gets preached by itself without the bad news and without repentance from sin. And so you factory produce so-called converts that say they believe in Christ and yet never forsake their sin. It produces a preaching that is entirely wrapped around the kindness of God with absolutely no mention of the necessity to mention God's severity. And it is a worthless so-called gospel. It's as if it costs them nothing, and it's as if it cost Christ nothing. As a result, the professing church today is ignorant. The professing church is ignorant. They are undiscerning. They don't precisely handle the Word of God, and as such, the proclamation of the truth, which is desperately needed, is quenched. We need to be faithful to the truth, precise with the truth, and bold with the truth. Anymore, the professing church cannot be characterized as the church, a people of the book. They're a people of truth and error. That, in and of itself, now think about it, Christian, gives us even greater responsibility. The truth has to go out. You have the truth. You know the truth. If you are genuinely in Christ, you are living the truth. It gives you greater responsibility in the midst of so much error, so many lies. 2,000 years of just factory-produced wickedness and confusion by Satan that we have to, with the truth, cut through to get the gospel through to the ears of the lost that need to hear it. Greater responsibility. I am sick of easy believism. Sick of it. I'm sick of cheap grace. I'm sick of, just sickened by so-called carnal Christianity. Aren't you? I'm sickened by health, wealth, and prosperity teachers that will go into slums and try to preach that gospel. I'm sickened by the seeker movement. Sickened by felt needs. Where is the truth of God? Aren't you sickened by the onslaught of all these deceits, all these deceptions, all these, while people are dropping into hell, listening to that filth. The truth must go out. The people of God must proclaim the truth of God. And how many, how many do you see out witnessing that are out there with you swinging the sword of truth? Very few. Remember here, the truth in the church is you personally, is me personally. It's interesting, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul calls James and John and Cephas pillars in the truth, uh, pillars in the church. That means they were men of respect, they were leaders, they were examples to follow, they were men of importance in the church uh, at Jerusalem. God calls the church the pillar and ground of the church, pillar and ground of the truth. What if James and John and Cephas, supposed pillars in the church, what if they crumbled? What if those pillars failed to uphold the truth of God, uphold the proclamation of the gospel, the true gospel? We'd have a works righteousness throughout the church today. <laughs> what if pillars, you pillar, me pillar, what if we failed to uphold and display the truth of God? We have great responsibility in this. We can't fail in our duty and we don't want to. If you're a Christian, you want nothing more than to please God in this. We've got to battle to proclaim this truth. We are to be a faithful basis 
and a faithful pillar. These are great responsibilities. Do you ever feel completely under the weight of all this? The weight of obeying the Lord in all these things, the, the, the weight of maybe all these commands, the weight of your responsibility, the weight of lost friends, family, loved ones, um, the weight of your stewardship over your husband, your wife, your kids, your household, the weight under the, the stewardship, the entrustment of your finances, of your example on the job, your example in school, your example to the lost people that you see. This is a great responsibility, great weight, right? Let me encourage you. You are a failure. <laughs> Does that encourage you? <laughs> I'm a failure. Listen, is, when you feel the weight of all that, it shouldn't be that that causes despair or causes concern or causes doubt or causes cowardice or causes retreat or causes discontentment or discouragement or despair. It shouldn't cause any of that. Listen, none of that is possible in your strength. You will never do it. You will never do it. It is in your weakness that God, Christ, is made strong. It is in the power of His might that you prevail. You can do nothing apart from the work of Christ. You can do nothing outside the past, present, and future work of Christ on your behalf. You can never do anything or be anything that is pleasing in God's sight apart from Christ. You are powerless against it. You are powerless to this work. You are powerless under the weight of this responsibility. You can do nothing apart from faith in Christ. What this should do is drive you to the Savior. Savior, And we are more than conquerors through Him, Christ, who loved us. That's a glorious blessing, a glorious truth. And in this, you conquer. In this, you are victorious. It is like the song that we sang. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. And so to, to strive away at your own efforts, your own, even worse, to strive away thinking that somehow that, that earns pleasure with God or earns favor with, with God, uh, you're not earning His pleasure. We're to live by faith in Christ. It's for Him and through Him and to Him that are all things. This is all fulfilled in Christ. It's left for you then but to walk in faith, to live by faith. To obey him in faith and to put the deeds of the death, the deeds of the body by the Spirit. Very quickly, and we are out of time. Lastly, it is our great responsibility to worship the source of that truth, the embodiment of that truth. If you remember the picture of the temple in Ephesus that we talked about last week, if you left that wicked pagan temple, maybe you walk down a street, maybe you start heading into a quieter part of town, maybe if you duck down a side street or a little alley, you might have heard at that time singing. Maybe you heard the faint sound of singing, couldn't quite make out the words, as you just pressed on until you came to the little house, and the words become a little bit clearer to you. God was manifested in the flesh, verse 16, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Verse 16 begins with a statement, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. That word controversy there, without controversy, could be translated confessedly or undeniably, by confession. In other words, this little verse in verse 16 was very likely a hymn that early Christians sang together celebrating the Lord, or a confession, a statement that they established that they would recite together the great truths that they believed. Great is the mystery of this godliness. This truth that we're talking about is not just a litany of facts. This truth produces godliness. If it is facts alone, it is nothing more than moralism, dead orthodoxy. What do you get? When you have facts without Christ, you get moralism. You get dead orthodoxy. It is the facts, it is the truth with Christ. If you are in the truth by faith, it is the truth that will lead to godliness by faith. He goes on to say that God was manifested in the flesh. Now, speaking of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, about 735 years before Christ, the Bible says, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth, the truth of God. And this is a great proof text here for the deity of Christ. Some of your translations say he... There's a one mark difference between 
the word for he in the Greek and the word, uh, an abbreviated word for theos or God in Greek. Many manuscripts say God, the he still refers to the prior antecedent, which is God. This is God manifested in the flesh, which means that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. It goes on to say that he was justified in the spirit. Better translation here to avoid confusion with our justification and salvation is the word vindicated. This word means vindicated. Christ made many claims, claimed to be the son of God, the son of man, claimed to be God in the flesh. Uh, He was sinless, and yet despite his claims, he was called a liar, a blasphemer, an imposter, a friend of sinners, a wine-bibber, a glutton. He was, in, he was called many things. Jesus Christ was vindicated in the Spirit. Romans 1, verse 2, it says that the gospel of God is that which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ was vindicated in the Spirit. He was seen by angels. According to Colossians 1.16, angels were created by him. In Colossians 2.10 and 1 Peter 3.22, they are subject to him. According to Hebrews 1.6, they worship him. In Revelation 5, they shout, worthy is the lamb. In Luke 2, they praised God at his birth. In Matthew 4, they ministered to him in the wilderness. In Matthew 13, 41, they execute his judgment. In Luke 24, they announce his resurrection from the dead. In Acts 1, 11, they announce his return. And in Matthew 25, verse 34, 31, they will attend his coming in glory. In 1 Peter 1, 12, they delight. They're fascinated by his gospel. These things are things that angels desire to look into. He was preached among the Gentiles. It goes without saying that preached necessitates that words are used. We're to preach, we're to herald the gospel. He was believed on in the world. Believed on in the world completely and totally by the mercy and grace of God. Have you believed on him today? That's because God, in his power, made you alive together in Christ so that you could hear, so that you have eyes to see, so that you have a heart and mind to understand the gospel. Considering your depraved nature, the depraved nature of men. It is a miracle that anyone in the world believes on Christ. It is a miracle, a testimony of His grace and mercy to us. Do you admit your depraved nature? You admit your condition outside of Christ. You admit your guilt before a holy and just God. Will you believe? Many, many, many have turned and believed on Christ. Why not you? What sin are you that enraptured by that you won't turn from it to believe on Christ, your creator, your judge? Turn to Christ. Turn from your sin. Follow him. Put your hope, faith, trust, reliance in Christ alone. This Christ is the one who lastly is received up in glory. All praise, honor, and glory be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. He'll either be your deliverer or he'll be your destroyer. Will you turn from sin? Church, will you serve him? It is a cause that is worthy. He is a king who is worthy. And we're to serve him in this cause together as a pillar and ground of the truth, as the household of God, the church of the living God. Will you serve him? Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for this this beautiful passage of scripture that we've spent several weeks in now and Lord, thank you for all that we've learned, all that you've taught us. Lord, thank you for the, the power, the efficacy, Lord, of your salvation in Christ. Thank you for the work of your spirit within us. Thank you, God, that it's not by our own strength. Thank you, God, that it's not in our own effort. Thank you, Lord, that in my wicked flesh, I don't do anything, can't do anything, Lord, to merit salvation, to earn your favor. Thank you that that has been done, it has been finished, it has been completed in Christ. And thank you, Lord, for his shed blood, his sacrifice. And thank you, Lord, for the empowerment, the enablement that you give for us to be pleasing to you in this Christian life, for us to have victory, for us to do faithfully the work in your vineyard that you've given us to do for your glory. Lord, we hallow your name here. We want you to be made famous among the Gentiles. Find us faithful in your spirit by the finished work and person of Jesus Christ alone to be faithful in the work that you've given us to do for your eternal worship. In Jesus' name, amen.